Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be talking about what is probably the most significant UFO sighting of the 1990s, a case that occurred in Rura, Zimbabwe, in which over 60 school children observed an unidentified object landing in their neighborhood and uh, some small alien beings emerging from the craft and interacting with the school children. My guest is Randall Nickerson. He is the director, co-writer, co-editor, cinematographer, investigative researcher, and producer of the film Aerial Phenomenon. He began his career as a stage and film actor. This is a brand new movie that reviews this very significant UFO event. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Randall. It's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you, Jeff. Uh, thanks for having me on. I, I appreciate it. Uh, you're very welcome. And uh, just so our viewers know, you're based in Massachusetts. Yes, Massachusetts and uh, New York City. You're speaking to me from your garage right right now, and I know it's it's almost the winter solstice, so it must be getting a little chilly over there. That that's true. Yep, it is uh, starting to feel like winter. Well, I'm very glad to be with you. I had a chance to view your movie Aerial Phenomenon, and I have to say. It really awakened me to the significance of an event that was sort of a passing event in the news. We heard about it, a UFO seen by dozens of school children in Zimbabwe. But, you know, things like that come and go. You've really dug into the significance of that event, looking back at it from a distance of over 20 years. Yeah, it, uh, I started in 2007 digging you know, that's when I got the, the footage from the Max, uh, the John Mack Institute. Uh, and they asked me to do a 30 minute DVD. And, um, you know, I had all of John Mack's interviews and those were absolutely fascinating. And then I was like, well, I have to, I can't just make a film with just uh, a, a limited amount of material, you know, one source, even though John Max was a good source. So I started to, to look into, can I find this school? And uh, it was Nicole Carter I ended up contacting in uh, Zimbabwe who had worked with, uh, who had also interviewed these kids at the time. And, you know, everybody else had told me the school had burnt down, you know, that it wasn't there anymore. And she said, hey, no, the school is there. And uh, within uh, um, two months, I had already, or right away, I booked a flight. And then tried to prepare myself to go into Africa, <laughs> which is um, anybody that's been there, um, you know, it's not a small deal or a small difference between the United States or Western countries and, and Africa. Um, so, yeah, that and that brought on all the other people that had interviewed these children that I had no idea about. I didn't know about the BBC reporter in the beginning. Uh, so I was at the school in 2008. That was the first time. Um, and basically I lived in Africa for a year and three months total, um, to track down a lot of the story and the witnesses and figure out like the sequence of events. I mean, that, that was very important to me. Like, um, I, you know, having these interviews is one thing, but what else happened? Uh, who else was there? Who else, you know, what was the story and what's, what was the sequence of events? Anyway, I spent an awful long time on that. 
One of the main threads of the film follows a, a woman currently living in Toronto, Canada, who was a, a grade school child at this school in, in Zimbabwe, a, a fascinating school uh, where white students and black students and white teachers and black teachers all seem to be uh, working together in harmony. And 60 of these children witnessed the uh, UFO and its occupants. But what I found fascinating is that this woman living in Toronto, 20-some years later, was still haunted by the experience. That's true. I, and I give a shout out for, to, to, her, to her, Emily, because she really, um, you know, took a risk like all the other people did in speaking about this. Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I didn't, there were witnesses all over the world. She happened to be very close to where I, you know, not too far from me, eight hours. Um, and I think you find that, you, you know, I found, uh, witnesses that do have that, uh, quite a trauma with it. And then others that don't. Um, and it seems to be around whether their parents, you know, a, a lot of it had to do definitely somewhat with the experience that they had, but also how they were treated, um, whether they were believed or not, or told not to talk about it at all, which there were quite a few very religious families at the time that, you know, didn't want to, you know, had, had an assumption of that it was either made up or that it was something evil, which I think doesn't help us figure this out when we get into the religious and other areas. We just have to look at the data. Yeah, there's a religious belief that these things are demonic. Yeah, and that's unfortunate because I don't think that's the case. You know, I just, it, it happens to many people of all different types all around the world. And, um, you know, I just don't think, I think we're dealing with something, honestly, from somewhere else, not, uh, not in a religious sense whatsoever, in an evolutionary sense. We're dealing with something that's evolved further than us. It's just, to be honest with you, a little bit exciting that we have an example of a, a species that has gone further and uh, um, off their planet, etc. I mean, I think the data and the people that are coming out now um, can speak better to that. Um, but um, I also wanted to say that, you know, I know originally the reason that number 60, 62 people at this school uh, came, it came from the number of drawings that were made by the kids, uh, the children at Ariel. Ariel being the, the name of the school. Correct. It, it's sort of a, a pun that y your movie is called Ariel Phenomenon. <laughs> Well, I got to put a shout out to a man, one of the witnesses named Shamba, who um, he, w during the interview, he, he this was in, uh, this is a long time ago, 2010, 2011. He said, you know, why don't you, wouldn't Aerial Phenomena be a fun name? And I'm like, wow. And so that came from uh, one of the witnesses themselves in 2000, 2010. And when I was doing the England interviews, because I've traveled, I know it t has taken an awfully long time to make this film, but it's, uh, you know, I had to go to these places where everybody moved because there were very few people left in Zimbabwe who were witnesses. So in, in the case of Emily, she, uh, as I recall, toward the end of the film, it points out she had created maybe 300 uh, drawings. I guess she was an artist and they were all pretty much focused on her memories of, of the UFO and its occupants. True. Uh, yeah. I mean, she's an incredible artist, in my opinion. I've uh, watched her paint and, um, you know, I, I that's one of the ways I've seen people um, deal with this. There are many different ways uh, when people get in, you know, after this incident that they get into adulthood and they have a way of um, expressing it or or blocking it out, not wanting to remember it. Uh, so there's two very, seems like two very distinct ways people deal with it. But yes, yeah, she's, uh, yeah, it's incredible. She's a plurific, uh, is that the right word? Plurific? 
That's a nice word. I'm not sure I've ever heard it before. I mean, she paints every day. You know, mm. it's, uh, she she's uh, has an incredible body of work, which is mm. eventually, I think she's um, she'll be a known artist at some point for sure. When it comes to a UFO sighting of this sort, there, there are many dimensions to it. One is simply, is it a nuts and bolts craft that could be tracked on radar, photographed? Uh, if it landed, did it leave landing traces? Uh, one of the things, the questions that I was left with after watching your film is nobody talked about the craft leaving. How, how did it, uh, uh, get out of there after it had apparently landed uh, right on the school ground. Well, there were a couple of children that were, that did comment about that. And basically that it, you know, just zipped off extremely fast and went toward the, the village that was slightly Northwest of the school. Um, and there were a couple, we just didn't, we didn't put, there was so much that, uh, there was so much material. There's 600 hours of footage. Yeah. So it was really hard to put it into an hour and a half. That was a, that was a real big challenge because how do you, this story was so, there were so many witnesses, not just children, adults also, pilots. Like there were so many um, different perspectives. And, how, you know, I had to, unfortunately, me, my editor, had to really go and make some real tough decisions. And uh, hopefully I'd love to do the director's cut where I can make it a the two and a half hour, three hour movie <laughs> that it was meant to really be to, to really give the comprehensive story. Because I think the times, um, dates, you know, where people were on the playground, all those kind of details that are really data driven and, and can be proven with photographs and stuff like that. Uh, are really important. Um, and there were photographs taken of marks on the ground. Um, there were, uh, there's a, just an awful lot that it was seen. Something was seen the night before on two radar systems. Uh, one heading, one was, uh, from Mexico city heading toward Africa. And the other one was the night before, um, from Johannesburg radar, which is the biggest radar coverage in that part of the, of Africa. I know at one point you showed a um, person with an improvised Geiger counter checking for radioactivity. And, uh, as I recall, not really finding anything unusual. Correct. And, uh, you know, that's, that's not uncommon that I've found that, uh, on some really uh, big cases that there were there were no trace there, there was no radiation there were you know the things you would think you would find you, you wouldn't even though people saw it sometimes photographed it or you know videotaped it but there was no um, emanation from it in an electro in the electromagnetic spectrum let's talk about the occupants there was at least one that everybody saw. Multiple people saw two. Um, and this is, you got to understand, this is a very large playground, like a, almost like a college, uh, you know, sports field, huge. And there's two levels. So, I mean, it's a, just a beautiful school, in my opinion. Um, and uh, there were some, uh, several, several uh, witnesses that, claim that it, right in the beginning that there were four. But the close contact that happened between the group, the kids that had gathered by the edge of the playground, uh, that was uh, one specifically that everybody talks about that came and approached the, the children that were gathered looking at this silver thing. And uh, that's what, what the closest contact that I'm aware of was. Um, and... I mean, kids were crying, kids were screaming, kids were just dumbfounded, you know, from just interviewing them and interview and looking at the archival and what they said about it, uh, which I would expect um, if you're looking at something that's uh, from some other evolutionary path, you know, potentially. And and this particular being, from based on the drawings that I saw, for the most part, really resembled the. Uh, 
type of being with the large almond-shaped eyes described by Whitley Strieber, and on the, particularly on the cover of his book Communion, which was a bestseller. True. I don't know if people realize, but 90%, it's probably higher than that, 90% of all um, uh, encounter events are these same um, biological forms with the big eyes, larger heads, um, like 90% around the world, China, Japan, other countries. They're not reporting something that's extremely different. There are small cases of that. But the majority are that are these small, frail-bodied creatures with large heads and large eyes. Um, the unique thing about Ariel, which was not common, was that they were dressed in black. Uh, their whatever the uniform or thing, tight-fitting suit that, that that they were wearing was black, um, and one of them was reported to have what looked like hair. But even John Mack, you know, the kids weren't sure whether it was some kind of hood covering or something like that. Um, that was unique, too. And I, so I did a lot of research like, well, where did this show up in other cases, you know, in the history of going all the way back to the 1950s? Uh, and there's only three that I'm aware of. Uh, so it was very unique in that sense, you know, because part of me was going on the 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 possibility of like, well, where did they get this story? If they made it up, where did they get it? And there's so much information in that in Ariel in the Ariel School events story that doesn't fit anything um, that was in the media or anything like that. So that made it unique in itself uh, and kind of said there's no way they could have made this up because they didn't have that information, you know. It wasn't like, and, and also in Zimbabwe at that time, it wasn't like they had access to a lot of that information, even today. Um, so yeah, there's, it's a very interesting case. Um, I still think about it every day. You know, I think about little details and like, hmm. What were some of these unique features? Uh, the way they behaved, uh, what they were wearing, uh, the, the time, um, the way time seemed to be manipulated in some way. Some of the children talked about their the way their their head was sort of stiff, like their neck was not free, you know, in a way that we have our necks and you know, it was much more rigid. Um, um you know, there's the there's the description they gave, there was no real talk or 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 videotape about that literally uh until 2011 2012 so a lot of those details they weren't even in the media every you know in 94 people were talking about gray aliens and gray suits and you know the same configuration large head large eyes oval eyes but yeah there were some very unique things which i'd love to have put in the movie um <laughs> But, you know, my editor, he's like, they're not, nobody's going to understand what those mean, you know, those differences. Um, but there's a, there's a file of them that I took, took aside saying, this is, this doesn't fit. I know some of the uh, children describe the craft itself as, as shimmering, uh, silvery, but uh, almost like it had a watery texture and, and that it would sort of move around. It would be in one location, it would be in another location, and it was not entirely clear that it was a physical craft. Yeah, there's no question about that. There were... Um... It, you know, there, it, it depended on where the kids were because, it, again, it's such, it was such a large playground that there was a, an upper field um, that you were quite a distance away from where this thing was initially saw seen. Um, and then there was the pool area, which is hundreds of yards away, uh, and people saw it from that perspective. And then also people who are, you know, a large group of kids had gathered right very close to, you know, within a hundred yards or so of it. Um, so you had a lot of different perspectives. Uh, and each one, which is fascinating, is each one of these children had a unique 
experience, you know, and how they described it, just like any child describing anything, it's going to be kind of, you know, how they perceive it with what they know and what they can compare it to in their own heads. Um, so, but it, it did move. That's true. Um, it went from one position to another position at least once. Um, is it a physical thing? Um, I, I, I would have to say, I, I believe so. And I, I think all those children, um, believe the same thing or most of them, because somebody actually went and interviewed those children years later, like three years later and, and asked those children, do you think this was real or a vision? Asked 43 children that question. And I think it was 40, 40 out of the 43 said it was real. So, and I don't, and some of those kids didn't even understand what he, the person was asking. Um, you know, what is, what's the difference between real and a vision, but he, he would try to explain it. But, um, I think it's, I think what we're dealing with is a nuts and bolts thing. Um, it's just the technology that brings it, that surrounds it, uh, makes it appear, um, that it's in some other realm, which if this is what we're hearing and what's been going on for all these years, that they have their literally uh, their own atmosphere around the, the craft itself, which awesome. allows them to go through different mediums, space, water, it doesn't matter because it's essentially its own planet. The occupant was sometimes described as moving in slow motion or even gliding over the ground. Correct. Yeah. But probably the the most interesting report, and this is the one that John Mack brought out uh, because he made a point of interviewing the students about their internal experiences, whereas other interviewers were more uh, looking for, you know, the external facts of the experience. Uh, many of the children reported f having a sense of what I would call telepathic contact with uh, this alien being. Yes. I believe that re really happened. Um, uh, several of have uh, talked about that. There's some of those people are in the movie. And then there's a whole bunch of others who would not were, were not willing to go on camera to talk about that. Um, mostly men, mostly the males, to be honest. Um, but there's no question in my mind after you know, interviewing people who didn't want to talk about it yet told me the very same thing those other kids had received. Um, yeah, told me that uh, that really did happen. Um, and that was probably, I mean, what their purpose for being there, I'm not quite sure what brought them to that location at that particular time. And there's been talk about that there's uranium uranium mines in, um, you know, uh, Zimbabwe. There was one not very far away from the school. There was there's one northwest of it that's probably 20 miles away. Um, but to me, that kind of factual stuff, uh, other people have brought that forward, um, isn't as important as, you know, maybe they were there, but why did they do that to primary school kids, you know, and why did they leave this message like this telepathic communication warning us about what we were doing to our own planet? I mean, that's pretty heavy duty to dump on children. <laughs> but, you know, again, those children have grown up with that consciousness in mind, you know, um, and haven't, I don't think any one of them that I know has forgotten that. Another fascinating thing that you cover is that that message was spread all over the world. The media picked up on that uh, uh, r remarkably. I mean, it was short-lived, I think, because of the news cycle. But for a week or two, or maybe even a few months, uh, the the international news was on that story. That's true. Yeah, it was all over the place and then disappeared. Uh, there was supposed to be a documentary made. Uh, John Mack was going to do a documentary uh, soon after all the media died down. 
there were reasons that didn't get made. There was a lot of legal issues and stuff with people that own footage and it never got made. And that's, to be honest with you, that's why it never got made until I got onto it. Um, and still for me, it was, it was a challenge, um, because of who owned what footage. Um, because, you know, there were six, seven different media outlets that also interviewed these kids. But back to you, what you were saying about John Mack's way of interviewing, you, you're right. I mean, he had a, a he went way far deeper um, because that's what he did. He spent 20 years as a, a child psychiatrist. And uh, so he had a lot of experience in it. And he brought out more of the emotional detail more of the what 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 was it that scared you what was it that made you happy what you know really focusing on the emotional uh journey rather than the detail um i think you see that in a lot of uh things that uh where people go for the facts but sometimes those facts are buried in the emotion you know in the in the so so to speak wound um because they're attached. Well, that was his great gift. And the irony is, here you have a, a pretty ironclad case with so many witnesses. And at the same time, you have deniers saying it couldn't have happened. It must have been mass hysteria. John Mack is, is crazy and he's a disgrace to Harvard University. And uh, uh, it, it's extraordinary the uh, an enormous social resistance that John Mack faced in particular, but certainly not, not just John Mack, as I recall, a BBC reporter who covered the story lost his job, his whole career with the BBC after that. That's, that's correct. I think, yeah, a lot of people paid a price at that time. I mean, I think the times have changed dramatically and, you know, since the New York Times at the end of 2017 and Pentagon people coming out, the Defense Department saying, you know, oh, these things are real. We don't know what they are. You know, things have changed quite a bit. But back in the 90s, as you know, was uh, a brutal time. Um, and I, I, every everybody paid a price one way or the other because at that point, uh, it was just seemed ridiculous to people that aliens would be here and how would they get here. All those different. Um, and John paid a big price. He really did. Um, reputationally, his friend circle. Um, I think that was the hardest part, to be honest with you, was John was a really well-renowned uh, psychiatrist. Pulitzer Prize winner. Pulitzer Prize winner, professor of psychiatry at Harvard University. He was, the you know, everybody wanted to be around him. And then when he looked into this subject and couldn't come up with a clinical uh diagnosis for these people and he was working with others as well um he stood his ground and said this is not a psychological problem this acts like a real event and then like his friend circle just literally disappeared so he went from you know and that i know hurt because it not only affected him it affected his wife and his family because they were the pinnacle at harvard you know and then all of a sudden um, John is pointing out this uh, abnormality in 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 this of these events, and that they don't fit into any category. And then you know nobody wanted to accept that at all, particularly Harvard. Well, of course, one of the confusing areas uh, concerning this debate is on the one hand, you've got sightings and the, the sighting that you describe in Zimbabwe seems unquestionably authentic. On the other hand, there are the abductions and uh, the evidence in support of the abductions is much more subjective. Uh, subjective how? I'm just... in, in the sense that it comes from the personal reports of the experiencers with uh, very limited uh, corroborating uh, evidence. Sort of. But I mean, those, those, a lot of those events are witnessed by other people as well. Um, friends, girlfriends, people that are close to those people. I don't know if yeah. people know that, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, the abductions, things that he was covering... I mean, people know very little about um, the information he was actually receiving. 
and witnesses to those events. You know, that I hope that actually starts to surface more because that's what makes a difference. You know, it's not somebody in their room and, you know, it's, they're just having a, a, a one-off experience that could be labeled as anything. It's the fact that there are witnesses. Well, as a matter of fact, I've done a couple of interviews with Ralph Blumenthal, who's written the book about uh, John Mack and, and the abduction cases. And uh, I'm certainly you know, not trying to discount the evidence completely, but some of those cases uh, were actually fabricated. They, they weren't all legitimate. So it, it created a, an aura of confusion. And just for the uh, benefit of viewers, uh, I'm going to link to the earlier interviews about John Mack uh, done by Ralph Blumenthal, who, who wrote a book about him. Sure. And I think that's I, that doesn't surprise me uh, that there w would be fabrications in this kind of uh, phenomenon or you know, mystery, so to speak. Um, and, you know, doing research uh, through that, because you, when you look at this whole subject, you really have to look at the whole subject. Uh, and there are certain things that you definitely delve into, and there are certain things you're like, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and there are, there are many, many, many credible people that I've met and have, who've told me in complete privacy about what has happened to them. And then there are people where I, I go, I, I don't know if I don't, you know, if you actually saw that, wouldn't you have a reaction to that? Mm -hmm. So there's, I agree. There is, um, uh, I don't know what you, in what you're referring to fabrications, but uh, I've seen, I've seen that in my own research. Well, everybody draws a line in terms of uh, how far they're willing to accept something. Uh, and I'm probably much more open than most people to a phenomenon of high strangeness. And John Mack was certainly open to phenomenon of, of high strangeness. But e even for me, I, I, there are some places I won't go to. Be, <laughs> they're just too much for me. And, and I know everybody has a line somewhere in the sand. Myself included. I, I, and I appreciate that. It's, it's good. I mean, you know, I, the way I see it is I go and establish like, okay, there's enough people that can testify to this who, who saw this. So we'll start from there. And then you go, well, well, what about the abductions? And then, you know, there's, it goes way deeper than that, you know, that the government's working with them, you know, there's all kinds of things. And, but you, yeah, <laughs> you, I try to be open-minded, but I'm looking like if I hear about something, I go there. I don't take somebody's word for it. I go there and I talk to people that live there, talk to people that were involved there, you know, on several other cases just to see well, what is the truth, you know, what's the actual truth here. There was one interesting scene in, in your movie in which it, I want to understand it better, but it appeared as if Emily, I believe it was, a woman from Canada who returned to visit the school, the aerial school in Zimbabwe, was talking to a, a man who seemed to be knowledgeable about the local uh, folklore or religious traditions and uh, that there had been quite a lot of lore about spiritual beings associated with certain locations uh, near the school, maybe someplace that looked like a, sort of like a cave or an enclosed area of rocks. And she went there with him to explore, was there a connection? The natives... Uh, uh um, Shona, that's the, 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 um, tribal group. Yeah. I wasn't aware of this the first time I went to the school. I've been there three times and the sec, so, but he, 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 he said that the entire school on three sides of it were surrounded by ancient, like some of the oldest burial sites of chiefs in Zimbabwe, um, all around that all around the school, the school sort of sits right in the middle of it. So the chief was, and I heard this from others that lived in that village, that that's why they came. This is their belief is they came because 
you know, this was, they were coming to where the tribal elders from hundreds and hundreds of years ago were buried. I mean, I don't know the truth of it, but th there's a lot of belief a of about these particular creatures. They've seen them before. It's not new to them. You know, that, that's what fascinated me about that whole thing was in other chiefs in other parts of Africa that I talked to. I mean, when I told them the story, they're like, of, of course, we know them. We've seen them. You know, we used to think that one of the things that was said was we used to think they were gods. You know, and that, you know, for thousands of years, they used to think they were gods. And it wasn't until in the last 50 years, they figured out that they weren't gods. They were using technology. So it kind of shifted a lot of these chiefs mindsets that and what they were also what they were doing to people. And there's still people in Zimbabwe and other places in Africa that put their beds on blocks to raise it above these creatures height. Be it, I swear to God, I saw it. And so they, they believe a lot of the native Shona and others, some Zulu, uh, believe that if their, their bed is raised, they won't be able to take them because that's what happens. They get taken at night. I mean, there's just so many, I mean, we have the American understanding of what abductions are and how they happen. But when you go to Africa and you hear the same story, and they're actually taking actions to try to make it not happen. But it's the same thing. That's stunning. That was stunning to me to talk to, to, to the chiefs and people that live there. Um, they're dealing with it. And they have a very interesting perspective of it, you know, that we, we don't, um, we, we just don't pay attention to that, unfortunately. But there is something important to, um, the, the tribal, the, the, the animism, the, the people who have been there for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. They've been dealing with it. And they have this, you know, passing down of knowledge. Um, and that's been part of it, that these things are here and they, they exist. And Well, certainly uh, one UFO researcher has focused on this is uh, Jacques Vallée, who was recently interviewed on this channel about another... Uh, sighting not well known uh, until recently that occurred in 1945 uh, within 20 miles and 20 days of the first atomic explosion here in uh, New Mexico where I'm located. Uh, and again, in that sighting and in several others, the occupants are described as, as short. You have these third, fourth, fifth graders describing the occupants as around the same size as they were. Yeah. Jacques Vallée has done some amazing work. I really, I met him once and um, just, yeah, that's great that he's, I didn't know about that case until uh, recently. And uh, the book was only released a few years ago. Now, Trinity, now in a second edition. There's so much evidence around the nuclear, you know, their interest in uh, what we're doing with nuclear weapons. And that totally makes sense, actually. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I think about is maybe, you know, since it's a planet killer, they may, their concern may not just be about human beings. You know, this is a huge biosphere with millions of species that, you know, are probably not common on other planets that may support life. So, and that we, we have developed us big monkeys here, <laughs> uh, have developed a technology that's extremely dangerous to everything. Um, so maybe, I don't know. I just, there definitely is enough evidence that I've seen and people I've talked to who've worked at these, you know, nuclear, uh, facilities and it kind of makes sense. That they would be paying very close attention to that. It also makes sense if, if they happen to come from a civilization that has a very advanced technology, far more advanced than uh, our most advanced systems of our most advanced countries, that they may have been coming here for a long time. I feel that's I'm just from the native conversations I've had out west in the Four Corners area and Africa, um, even Alaska. Um, yeah, they've been around 
for a long, long time. Thousands. I mean, there's chiefs that I spoke to, Zulu, uh, Credo Mutua, and, you know, he's, he was, they've been here for thousands of years. And you find this not just amongst the uh, Zulu and other African cultures, you find it um, uh, pretty much amongst indigenous people worldwide. Yeah, the uh, Aborigines in Australia, uh, South America. Yeah, an enormous history uh, in, in places like Peru and amongst the uh, Quechua Indians high in the Andes mountains. Well, Randall, this has been a pleasure to speak with you. I want to compliment you on uh, working so hard and diligently over a, a period, it sounds like, of more than a decade, close to 15 years to get this film out. Yeah, thank you. I, I really do appreciate it. And I got to say, before we leave, that I, I did watch some, you know, in the making of this film, interviews that you did a long time ago with Dr. John Mack and, and others. And and I really appreciate your work and dedication that you've done for an awfully long time. Thank you, Randall. And thank you for being with me today. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. Thank you.